It's a late night in the deep country, at a silent highway intersection somewhere in Mississippi, where a young teenager waits alone in the dark with nothing but a guitar in hand. Although the true specific crossroads is widely disputed, they're sure that this is the right one, where they can meet the devil. Suddenly, they hear something strange off in the distance, faintly over the sound of the cicadas. It's almost like music, an ethereal guitar just barely too far to make out, but it sounds strangely familiar. The music slowly gets louder and louder until it seems to be coming from all directions. A haunting voice wailing in falsetto joins in. The teen looks around and off in the distance sees a car approaching. A car almost certainly driven by the devil. As quick as they can, they flee from the crossroads, begging for Jesus' forgiveness for ever going there. The blues is a genre of music, a feeling, and, to many, a religion. The literal musical definition of the blues is a song style of American black origin that is marked by blue notes and a 12-bar chorus consisting of a three-line stanza, but the world of the blues is much deeper than that. Francis Davis, a prolific blues historian, writes of blues as a musical melanin pentatonic cargo imported to America from West Africa with shiploads of slaves. Blues music is undoubtedly a creation of the descendants of black slaves, but even after Reconstruction, the lives of blacks in the South were not dissimilar to lives in slavery. Davis describes life in the South as having the conditions of an urban ghetto spread out over a rural landscape, where violence, disease, and extreme poverty were the norm. Young men would travel long distances in order to work odd jobs to support their families, or would abandon those families altogether. Usually uneducated and often unemployed, a great number of young black men saw music as the only possible alleviation from the status quo. As young musicians were flung across the country, a massive music culture began to emerge, centered around the blues. In its halcyon days, the blues were the antithesis to the equally black gospel music. They were associated with sin and debauchery, played in juke joints, where sex, violence, and drugs were just as much a feature as music and dance. While juke joints were shunned by black churchgoers, white society saw these behaviors as something far more monstrous. To polite white society, any aspect of black culture was seen as savage and unholy, and black people as beasts and monsters. This is most easily seen in touring minstrel shows, which flooded white and black audiences alike with dehumanizing depictions of blackness. The cultural consequences of these shows linger to the modern day. Every human culture has monster beliefs. There's an entire field of academic study devoted to monsters, a subset of which being monster anthropology. In Monster Anthropology in Australasia and Beyond, University of Sydney anthropologist Yasmin Musherbash explains that taking seriously how the monstrous manifests locally and documenting the socioculturally specific way in which people relate to monsters reveals how people understand themselves, their world, and their position within it. Monster anthropologists look at monster beliefs and study the significance of those monsters as a part of reality for their mother cultures. While a cryptozoologist might seek to prove or disprove the existence of Wendigo or Bigfoot, a monster anthropologist would examine what those monsters mean to the people whose experience they are a part of. Blue's culture has its own share of beliefs in supernatural, but the most well-known of these is the story of Robert Johnson. At the peak of the Great Depression, Robert Johnson was one of many wandering young men going wherever there was work. He lived a lonely, sad life with a sharecropper mother and an absent father. He was widowed at the age of 19 and near blind in his left eye. At some point, he left to Robbinsville to find the father who abandoned him. Nobody saw him for six months. When he returned, the shy boy was suddenly a charismatic womanizer with two working eyes. Most astoundingly, though, he was a master of guitar like nobody had ever seen before. 
Rumors started that Johnson had gone to the crossroads and sold his soul to the devil in exchange for the ability to play, and play he did all over Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee. Word would spread for miles around every time he played about the best blues man who ever lived. Wasn't long before, in 1936, he got a record deal with the American Record Corporation. In five days, he recorded 16 songs, four of which seeming to be about being haunted by a devil met at the crossroads. Then, just a few months after recording, Robert Johnson was dead at age 27, poisoned by the husband of one of his girlfriends. His record reached the top of the race record charts, but he was dead before he could see it happen. That's one version of Johnson's story. However, as old as it sounds, it's a very recent story, and one notably invented more than 40 years after Johnson's death. Nobody who knew Johnson at the time would ever say he had anything to do with the devil, but the myth of the crossroads is the only way most people have even heard of him. In Robert Johnson, Lost and Found, blues historian Barry Lee Pearson and author Bill McCulloch took on the unenviable task of unraveling the actual facts of a well-loved story. In summary, they found that at no point during Johnson's career did anyone even consider a deal with the devil taking place, and that the story was constructed over the course of 50 years as a product of ignorance and economics. White ignorance about African American traditions and culture and the desire to find new ways to market Johnson's music. The Robert Johnson myth is an invented one, largely pushed by Columbia Records in the 1970s during the blues and folk revival movement in the US, whose main audience was young whites. Incomplete and imprecise descriptions of Robert Johnson were rewritten and repackaged as mysterious and supernatural, and minor personality quirks were inflated to be proof that Johnson was morphed into a soulless being. This tactic was a commercial success, causing a feedback loop of more and more extreme word-of-mouth retellings of the Johnson myth. By 1986, there was a major film starring Ralph Macchio titled Crossroads based on the Robert Johnson myth, solidifying the story in American popular culture. A long-dead blues man with one record was suddenly once again embraced by new generations of blues and rock musicians as a monster story much larger than life. What's interesting about the Robert Johnson myth is not that it is false, but that it is true. Countless modern musicians, white and black, musically descended from the old blues men, believe in the Robert Johnson story. Many take pilgrimage to where they believe the deal was struck, and many have met the devil and made the exact same deal. Still, even embraced by many black people, the cultural baggage from the myth's white origin is immeasurable. Monstrosity and race have a deeply troubling relationship within the post-industrial world. Even in the past century, anti-black beliefs have festered within American culture. From the news, to film, to books, to religion, black people have long been depicted as savage cannibals, brainless rapists, and any other manner of monster. These beliefs are deeply ingrained not only within non-black cultures, but within black cultures as well. Joseph Winters, professor of African and African American studies with Duke University, wrote at length in The Horrifying Sacred, Hip Hop, Blackness, and the Figure of the Monster, about what he calls a pernicious legacy of associating blackness with the not quite human, with that proverbial space between the human and the animal. Through the sharing of anti-black monster beliefs, racists tap into base human fears to instill a hatred of blackness in white and black peoples alike. This is what the minstrel shows of Robert Johnson's day did. This ingrained congruence between blackness and monstrosity explains why the Robert Johnson story was so successful. Inadvertently, the myth is a perfect microcosm of anti-black conceptions of blackness, the black man who can only profit through sin, the black man whose talents are unearned, the black man who suffers, all wrapped up in a story which, at some level, makes out black spirituality to be occult, unenlightened, and unholy. The myth of Robert Johnson is not, in total, a racist one. The people who believe it are not necessarily racist or anti-black. 
For most of its believers, race isn't even a part of the story. However, acknowledging the racial aspects of the story is integral to understanding its place in music culture history. Joseph Winters wrote about another side of the relationship between blackness and monstrosity. For some black artists, monstrous identities and tropes reinforce fantasies of triumph and invincibility while also expressing themes of anguish and mortality within black culture by turning old conceptions of monsters into sorts of anti-heroes, directly confronting the old white perceptions of blackness. For many, this is the role Robert Johnson fills, denying monstrosity by embracing it and turning it back on white conceptions of sacred and monstrous. The idea of Robert Johnson as the protagonist and not the antagonist shows us that the conceptions of good tied to financial success and social standing are not sacred, and that the conceptions of evil tied to black spirituality and black art are not monstrous. While originally a white story born of ignorance and implicit racism, the myth of Robert Johnson has become for many an empowering one that breaks down the walls between monster and man. As for Robert Johnson the man, Pearson and McCulloch found out that in the time of his disappearance, he was spending his time practicing so he could play the music that he loved. It turns out all the mysteries of Robert Johnson's life weren't a cult, just forgotten. To the people who knew him, he was an extraordinary man, but still, just a man. To the people who believe in Robert Johnson the myth, the monster, he's much, much more. <laughs>